to join in more or less announcements. If you've, if you've uh, been on Facebook or if you've uh, looked at the emails, you kind of know what those are, but I'm going to keep pushing those because I think that they're important. And then uh, uh, I want to give you a little bit of update from my doctor's school on the Thursday. And then I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but i got to give you lessons from a hip replacement. Okay? <laughs> I got to give you a lesson, okay? When you when, when you got six weeks, and basically all you do is is uh, is physical therapy, uh, eat, and not a whole lot of uh, not a whole lot of sleep. You have an awful lot of time to think, okay? And uh, and I'm a learner, so uh, uh, I, the Lord gave me some lessons. Uh, I think the neat thing that uh, that uh, as you hear the lessons, I think you're going to see that you know those really apply to just about anything in life when life happens, whether it's a hip replacement or something uh, at work or something at home. Uh, these are lessons that can work uh, you know, for all of us. And then I want to introduce maybe the last 15 or so minutes of the teaching time, uh, the uh, series that we're going to be going into uh, out of Matthew chapter 10, out of Matthew chapter uh, chapter uh, 10. Okay. Uh, first thing, I'm going to do a couple of uh, promos. Uh, throw the slide up there on the uh, inputs. Uh, uh, last week, uh, this was promoted, I think, in the worship service. It's been on the front page of the uh, uh, church's website. This is, I, I do a lot of leadership, personal growth. I do a lot of leadership development. Next leadership slide. is a passion for me, as most of you know. But there's been one training event over the past 21 years okay that is impacting me more than anything else and that's this event that's this event it's uh it's live simulcast uh, out of chicago uh the great uh, willow creek uh, church uh, uh bill hybels is uh, founding and still the, the current pastor they uh, although they are in a search uh to transition uh, bill out bills in his uh, mid uh, mid 70s you've got two days of uh, uh, some of the best practitioners and speakers. Uh, uh, a couple of bookends this year, Bill will open it and Andy Stanley will close it in terms of speaking. And then in between our speakers from the marketplace, from really academia and, and government, uh, it's unapologetically biblical and Christian, but I want you to know that out of, out of about 600 host sites in North America, and about half a million people watching. Somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of the folks engaged are not Christian. So it is a tremendous evangelistic opportunity. Okay, and uh, so I wanted you to know because uh, you know a lot of the speakers are not are not Christian, uh, but they are uh, they are at least uh, in fact some of the speakers always say. I am out of my element here because I'm in a church, which is where it's being simulcast from, but uh, we've just seen a lot of uh, great men and women leaders in the marketplace government really come to Christ as a result of this experience, okay? And uh, I'm telling you that the teaching that is a result of this, you don't have to have a title, you don't have to still be uh, working in the marketplace. Uh, the principles that you and I hear, uh, I really think are practical. Uh, those that come from Christians are biblical, but uh, they're very actionable, they're very helpful in life. And we get a really, really reduced rate as a host site. But that ends July 12th. That ends July 12th when the price uh, goes up. So I just want to encourage you, it might be something you want to sign up for as a table. We can reserve a table for you if you want to have your table together. And if you can't come to all of it or part of it, I think it'd be worth your while, but I wanted to put that in front of you. In fact, next week, uh, I'm going to kind of do the offering and the announcements and a welcome uh, in the weekend services with the exception of the 10 o'clock service uh, because I said, I am not missing my class. <laughs> okay, you get somebody else to do it, all right? I'll do it at 39 at 8.30 and 11.30, but I'm not missing my class, and I'll be speaking to this in the class, okay? Uh, the next slide has to do with this huge push about something that I have absolutely no knowledge about, social media and Facebook, all right? I, but, uh, uh, you know, I, when I, I went to really Matthew probably two months ago and I said, listen, I just need some vehicle, some tool to stay better in touch and really to reach out uh, to others that may not be in a, in any kind of a Bible study. And he said, are you on Facebook? And I said, no. <laughs> and I uh, said, so we, we need to create a Facebook page for Journey. And, and, and we have, we have about 130, I don't even know what the term is, followers? 
Is that, is that, the, is that the term? Uh, so if you're not one of those, shame on you. God bless your sin, sick, shriveled up soul. Okay? Right now as I'm talking, okay, go and uh, to that link and, uh, and, and click whatever it is, uh, like, join, whatever it is, and join us because one of the things moving forward, I've got two or three of them, is uh, uh, on a weekly basis, uh, I won't say most of the time, my goal is weekly, but I may guess it sometimes, I'm going to do a little recap of the previous week's lesson, just a couple of minutes, just a recap. And then I'm going to do a preview of what's coming Sunday. Uh, and I'm hoping that, that, you know, that will help you, but more than anything, that you will share that with the mutual friends that you have. And, uh, and uh, obviously, if they're local and not in life group, you know, and invite them to come and to join us here. Uh, so really help me here. I, I'm in an element of which I am not familiar uh, in social media, but uh, I, I understand the power of it. And uh, so uh, sign up if you've not uh, done that. Okay? All right. Let me, let me uh, move into some life lessons from the hill. Uh, go to the verse. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is looking back. And he's looking back to the calling out of the, of the nation Israel and lessons that, that they learned uh, as a result of their, as they were, their, their walk and their pilgrimage with God, which was not always uh, as a result of their obedience. Often it was a result of their disobedience. Paul is looking back on the history of the Jewish nation and he, he, he writes these words. Now these things, like how to them, as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages come. In other words, Paul was writing to the Corinthians saying, listen, I know that was thousands of years earlier. But the lessons they learn from life experiences still have something to say to us today. And we need to listen. And we need to learn. Uh, one of my strengths is I am a learner. Uh, I, I, I love study. I love knowledge. I love facts. I love information. And uh, I, I love trying to squeeze uh, you know, all the lessons that I can. Uh, when you and I went to school, which for some of us was a long time ago, in school, the typical uh, uh, mode is they teach lessons. And then after so many lessons, you take a test to see if you've learned the lessons. You do know life doesn't work that way. Life reverses it. We get a series of tests. And then we decide whether or not we learn anything. And often when we don't, because God has a great sense of humor, we get on the very go round. Because we have refused to learn lessons. And uh, I don't want to be that way. I really want to squeeze everything that I can in life lessons to help me to be a, a better person, a better Christ follower, a uh, better husband, granddad, and, uh, and, uh, and, and so on. So, I want to give you these... I'm just going, I'm not going to elaborate on them. Uh, I tried to reduce them at one point, there were two or three pages. Okay, because uh, there's a lot for me to learn, obviously. Okay, but put it in, you know, my context was a hip replacement for you. You know, maybe you had an automobile accident. Maybe you got a terrible doctor here for Maybe you're facing uh, surgery. Maybe uh, there's some issues going on in the home. Maybe there's some issues going on at work. I, I don't know, but I do know life happens and throws tests at all. And I think we need to posture ourselves kind of work. So here are the, the lessons. There are nine of them. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. I think they'll be self-explanatory before we move into the Matthew chapter 10. Uh, number one, life is moving way too fast and I can't slow it down. And that really frustrates me. I just sometimes want to put it on pause. How can you just slow it down just a little bit? It just seems to be just buzzing at, at uh, speed of light. Just please slow it down. 
May 17, I had surgery and I stand here 46 days later. And I feel like all I did was take a deep breath or blink my eyes. Uh, I started having pain in my hip in, in October and I can remember the day that I was running and feeling the discomfort as if it was this morning. It was eight months ago. Uh, the Bible is right. Life is a vapor. Life is a mist. Life is like the morning dew. And the older you get, the smarter that ought to make you in squeezing everything that you can out of this life that's moving way too fast. Number two, humanity. My humanity is fragile and frail, especially as I age. I can't admit that, but I still have a ways to go to embrace that. I hate being human. I just hate. Uh, but you can't. The only way to beat this is die. Okay? And I know I'm going to heaven. I look forward to going to heaven. We talked about heaven in here, but I am not signing up for the next load. Okay, I don't care how painful and agonizing, okay? Uh, you only get one shot here. And we need to make the best of that, even in the sense of, you know, I didn't tell you not that it matters, but some of you who are aging will understand this. I had not just my hip surgery May 17th, but within three weeks prior to that, I had an endoscopy and a colon. Okay, I had been poked and prodded in every crevice of my vision. <laughs> and they put me in, under anesthesia for all of us. Okay, so if I say anything goofy, I may still be under anesthesia after three uh, doses of uh, doses of that. Just can't be. But I do know from my heart issues years ago, and it changed my life from the standpoint of exercise, uh, eating, and being healthy. Uh, my surgeon and my physical therapist said, you are weeks ahead of most of the patients because you were in good shape coming in. And it matters. Okay? Is eating like fun? I don't think so. Eating <laughs> healthy. Uh, is exercising fun? I don't think so. I know, it's just me. Okay? Uh, I've had folks who I think they were goofy and said, well, the, the more you exercise, the more you like it. I think they're nuts. <laughs> okay, maybe that's true of them, but they're deranged. Okay, it's just a necessary part of life. So I'm encouraging you, regardless of your age, you'll be smart to eat better and exercise. You'll be glad, and I've come to the conclusion not to do that. Maybe one of the most selfish decisions you and I can make for the people that we love. Okay, number three. We tend to take the common, simple, and ordinary activities and blessings of life for granted. We tend to take those for granted, okay? I get in the shower every morning, shower myself, okay, and go through the day, okay? Uh, I couldn't do that for three weeks. I need to help. I couldn't put shoes and socks on. I couldn't walk. There was a lot of things that I do on a day-by-day -day basis. I couldn't sit, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't drive. Those are things that I took for granted I've done every day for years. But when they're taken from you, they mean a lot more. They mean a lot more. Number four, I was humbled. I was humbled by the lack of uh, uh, being dispensable. In other words, other than the last two or three weeks just coming in for a couple hours, I've not been at my desk, and as it were, my post, in the, in the leadership, as it were, of my ministry for six weeks, okay? And you know what? It went on. It went on. And it just reminded me that all work, ministry, leadership is integral. I don't care if you're 20 or 60. It's in, it doesn't last, and that humbles me. Number five, I don't do downtime as well as I should. I'm still a very impatient person. I still have room to grow the fruit of patience. What concerns me is, you know, retirement, redeployment is out there for me, and it concerns me that I've not learned how to relax. 
and to have margin pay time. It concerns me, not just for me, but for Linda. Okay? Uh, I don't want to drive her crazy. I don't want her telling me, please go find something to do. You're driving me nuts. <laughs> Number six, it's a great privilege to be loved. It matters that others show that they care. You did. I got cards, I got letters, I got emails, I got texts, I got balloons, I got fruit. Uh, I, you, you show you care. But more than anything else in those expressions, whether they were cards or emails, almost all of you who expressed that made this comment. I'm praying for you. And here's what Here's what has come to my mind. You are a blessed person if you have anyone praying for you. Anybody. Because my guess is a lot of the people that we know, especially that are unbelievers that we've up over to visit, they may not have anybody who ever lifts their name to God in prayer. And that scares me. And I'm honored. I know I was on you know, the lips of many of you in prayer. And uh, I'm afraid that over the years that folks that called me praying for you, what have you, I just kind of smiled, thank you, and did not appreciate that to the level that I should have. To the level that I should have. To be careful is a, is a wonderful thing. Many don't have it. Number seven, good health, whether it's physical or spiritual, emotional, is a team effort. Uh, I had the best surgeon in the world, uh, the, the, those who attended to me in the hospital. Uh, my surgery was late on May the 17th. It was supposed to be early in the morning. It was late that afternoon. Uh, excuse me, middle of that afternoon. Uh, and uh, I was in physical therapy. I had surgery about 1230 and physical therapy about 4 and home by noon the next day. All that. That's a great team effort. Huge team effort. Uh, folks taking the talents and abilities that God has entrusted to them, though they may not appreciate the source of those, uh, and, and, and all of those with the physical therapist, all of those that came into my home for a couple of weeks, and then the one that I've been working with the last uh, few weeks, it, it's a team effort for us to stay, you know, in good health, and we need others to do that. All right, two more. Number eight, personal discipline is essential and hard. I've heard over and over again from the professionals taking care of me, you'll come out of this quicker than most folks because you were disciplined and in good shape when you came in. And, uh, and I, I know for some of us, being disciplined is easier than it is for others. Uh, I know we say that, but I don't believe that. I believe that every one of us is disciplined. But some of us are just disciplined to be lazy. That's a discipline. You've got lazy down. Perfected. Okay, you've got inactivity and lack of exercise. Perfect. I don't do that. One of the things, one of the fruit of the Spirit along with patience. And one of the, uh, one of the uh, 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 attitudes of life that Paul says can put you in a place of being disqualified in terms of effectiveness is a lack of self-control and lack of discipline. And I just want to encourage you, again, I know it's easier for some, like me, than it is for others. Work really hard. Work really hard at being disciplined and self-controlled. Maybe spirit disciplined, spirit controlled. Okay? Very, very helpful. And then the last one, I don't know if this is the most important, but the last one is my wife is a true servant. Okay? I want anesthesia for a hangman. <laughs> Okay, I have, I have, some people would have a higher or low threshold of pain. I have no threshold of pain. Okay, I hate pain. Okay, I hate visiting hospitals because they're there because something hurts. I am not a great patient. I remember early on when we got home, I was telling another table, uh, early on, some of that ended up being medicine related. I remember waking my wife up because getting in out of bed was extremely difficult waking her up and just standing there in front and just, you know, frankly crying out in tears, what's wrong with me? And I was just 
shaking and almost in a, a panic attack. And my sweet wife walked me through those nights, you know, walked me through all of the, the care that was that was a high maintenance individual. And uh, and she did it with the best hearts and attitudes and encouragement uh, along the way. And uh, I just realized again uh, that uh, that I so over Mary. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and hugely uh, 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 high maintenance and, uh, and I know that and she uh, uh, just loves me unconditionally and serves me and I'm blessed by that I'm blessed by that okay alright Uh, let's begin uh, to look at, uh, at the, this next series. Uh, I'm going to kind of start here in the, in the remaining time that I have continued to introduce this new series. It's probably going to go six, maybe uh, seven uh, weeks. Uh, I'm going to begin with a statement that you think you're listening, guy. Uh, and some scriptures, uh, but I, I'm moving toward Matthew 10, just trust me, I'm, I'm just trying to, uh, to build a foundation uh, for uh, this next series. Salvation, the privilege of a personal relationship with God is a gift with a goal. It's a gift. With the goal. The first part, I'm pretty confident that you are aware of. I'm not sure the last one we we are intentional about enough. Uh, this will be important. Uh, I got two questions at the end to ask you. Okay, and and the first question is going to be a very uncomfortable question in the sense I think some of you are going to really struggle to articulate a clear answer. I think when we often think of salvation, we tend to think of it, if we think of it in terms of gold, heaven. And you know we believe in heaven. Talk about it in every eight weeks. It's, it's, it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful But that's the ultimate goal. That's where we end up. Is there no goal in the meantime? If there isn't, then when we receive the gift of salvation, why doesn't God just go ahead and take us up? But there are very, very few deathbed salvations. Most aren't. Most are left. Most are first are experienced in children and youth. Because statistically, the older you get, the harder it is to say yes to Jesus. So most get saved four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, fifteen, sixteen, somewhere in that ten to twelve year period. Most. And live lives of 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. So the norm is for to experience this gift and to be left. Though heaven is out there. So a question that uh, at the end I'm going to ask you is, well, listen, if if the hope of heaven were not there, I know it is. I know it's hypothetical. But if the hope of heaven we're not there. Would you still be a follower of Christ? That demands a Okay. What I don't know around the table because the intense peer pressure is how honest you can be. I know that. Okay. But I'll let you know because you'll be thinking about that question for a while. Is I've asked that question in a lot of different groups, usually men. And I have watched group after group, man after man, struggle in answering that question. Why am I a follower of Christ? But leave my hope ahead of now. 
uh, scripture. Salvation is a gift based on just a couple of passages from Paul, one in Ephesians, one in, uh, in, uh, in Romans. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. I know you're familiar with that. Just for, for by grace, grace, unearned, undeserved. We need to remember that. Some of us in the room have been saved for a long time, and uh, it's easy to forget uh, that years and years ago you didn't earn it or deserve it, and God graced uh, you into a relationship with Him uh, through your faith, through your trust, through your belief, through your repentance, through your uh, 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 trust in Him and the work of His Son. This is not of your own doing. Not of your own doing. It's not anything we did. It's a gift, a free gift, a grace gift. Not result of works. Any, uh, not anything that we can do to earn it or to deserve it. So that no one give up. And the reason that's important is for the assurance and the security relationship that you and I have with God. We could be in a worse condition than we are when we when we first experience the salvation. We were, uh, uh, we were sons and daughters uh, of Satan. We were enslaved by sin. Uh, we basically did the bidding of the world. In fact, Scripture said that we were objects of the judgment of God. We were enemies of God. That is a terrible condition. And God saved us out of that condition. And made us His children, His sons, and His daughters. The reason this is important that we didn't do anything to earn it because when we first received it, we could not be in a worse condition. <clears throat> Once we receive it, if it was undeserved and unearned in the first place, then what could we possibly do thereafter now that we are his sons, daughters, and children to forfeit it if we didn't do anything in the first place to deserve it? If it was a gift, because if I do something after establishing a relationship that could cause that relationship to be severed, then I did something to earn it in the first place. It is a grace gift. But as we we'll see in a minute, yes, there is saving grace and there is dying grace. Yes. Okay. But grace does not deliver us from being responsible from being responsible as disciples in that minute. Next uh, passage, that Romans 5, 15 to 17. You're going to see, so it's a little wordy up here, but you're going to see five times a phrase, and then a, really a couple of times, uh, though it's not up there uh, uh, in terms of being circled or bolded, is grace. But just, uh, but let me, uh, uh, let me read it. But the free gift, it's not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, through Adam's sin, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Verse 16. And the free gift is not like the result of one, that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For, for if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the fifth times the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Though it is based on grace, though the salvation that you and I, uh, uh, that you and I experience through grace, grace does not eliminate us of the responsibility to walk with God. It does not give us the right to live any way they want to live and, and say, well, God has to forgive me. Grace, uh, let me put this out, grace doesn't fix us up where we can't sin. It just fixes us up where we can't enjoy it anymore. We can't live in it anymore. Then then we won't say we do. Okay? Uh, as, as you've heard me share, I, I, I think the, the most... Uh, uh, Engaging question of someone who's struggling with the assurance of their relationship with God is this question. Ask them this. How do you feel when you sin? How do you feel when you sin? Now, the goal. Go to the next slide. The goal, if I'm not even addressing, I think the 
goal of salvation that is a gift is twofold. And, and Kevin, you even mentioned this in your prayer about being one before you try to make one. Is that the first and the most important goal is, is being. It's internal. It's character. It is, and we'll see in verses 24 and 25 for next week in Matthew 10, that it is the basic premise of what it means to be in a relationship with God and to receive the free gift of salvation. And that is we are on a journey to become as much like Him, first of all, internally, in character, in our lives, uh, and, and, and attitudes, beliefs, and, and behaviors, and anything else. It starts there. Out of that comes the doing, the external, and the conduct. If you reverse that, one of two things result. Legalism or hypocrisy. And we all know folks like that. They forgot if they ever do. My question in relationship is saying, the most important thing about the transaction of, 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 of salvation and relationship with God is change. And that change is into the likeness of Jesus Christ first in who we are and then in what we do. And then in what we do. Critically important to be like Him. As well. Now, the first one, the being the eternal, is the hardest it's the most difficult to take place because I call it heart work. And heart work is always the hardest work. It's always the most difficult. Okay? So that requires internal transformation and change. It's just easier to kind of play the game and do things in a hypocritical or legalistic fashion and not have the transformation take place inside. Okay? So... Let me remind you of the, mass, of, the, of the mandate. Go ahead to the next slide. The mandate. This is very familiar. We know these, uh, uh, these four verses, especially the last three, as the Great Commission. I think practically for many Christians, in a practical sense, it probably is more of a great omission. It's what we know we should do, but it's what we usually don't do. Okay? And let, let, me, let me read through this because the series is about <laughs> discipleship. And understanding the basis of that, which is a grace gift of relationship, and understanding the mandate, okay, uh, I think will help us to put in context the importance of what we're going to talk about in Matthew chapter 10, okay? So, uh, uh, let, me, let me kind of unpack this just for a minute. Now, the 11 disciples, uh, now, uh, uh, the uh, opening conjunction there, uh, I, I think a better rendering would be then. Then. Then the 11 disciples went into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. Then. Okay, whenever you see, usually, whenever you see then, uh, kind of like therefore, whenever you see that, you ask yourself, what is, what, you know, when is then, what is therefore? Uh, and that is then. Then would be, uh, I'll just keep it in their earthly context, after the birth, the sinless life, the powerful miracles, the unparalleled, authoritative teaching, uh, the deliverance from uh, Satan and demons, uh, the, uh, the, all that Jesus said and did and taught and then, uh, and then uh, uh, frankly, illegally arrested, condemned, and crucified and resurrected. That's them. That's them. This is a resurrected, living, not just Savior, but proven Lord over everyone and everything. He goes to Galilee to the mountain that Jesus had and said, you go there. And He directed them. Verse 17, and when they, and this is not, it's, not, it's important, when they saw Him, they worshipped Him, but some doubted. 
What you need to realize that contextually, it's not just the 11 disciples. Judas has already hanged himself. It is the 11 disciples and others who had chosen to follow him and were genuine in their followership. Many, and that's what is so uh, you know interesting to me in studying through the Gospel of Mark, of, of, of the massive crowds who followed him, but only because they wanted a free meal and healing. Not because they wanted a Savior of the Lord. They wanted a magical God who would do something for them. Be a genie for them. So in this crowd, you've got, you've got some who worship Him, who love Him, who believe Him, who are genuine, and then some who doubt, who don't. Well, we probably have that in this room. We definitely have it in a worship service. You're always going to have that. So that's who's hearing what he's about to say. And Jesus came and said to them, again, this is the, those who love him and believe in him and worship him and follow him, and those who doubt him, don't believe in him, want the wrong things from him. They're both hearing what? Some authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Most. How much? Oh. You understand how gigantic that is? Why, why is that important? Well, let me see if I can give you a, 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 an analogy. When we leave the property today, later on, at least this used to be true. I, I'm usually here before those folks get here, and I usually leave after they're here. We used to have men and women in vest who would help direct traffic. Some of you may have done that around the property, okay? And then usually at key places, we would have <clears throat> uh, we would have clothed either Orange County or OPD officers armed, right? Okay. Which of those two carries the most authority? <laughs> you know, I, I have watched it. Okay, as, as some of you, I've watched people almost run over our people. <laughs> Why? I don't care that you have an orange vest on. Get out of the way. <laughs> Okay? And they, you know, they're doing this and, you know, you're giving them another sign that you shouldn't be giving them and, and all of that. And then, and then, and yet, then you pull up and you see in front of you this dark blue or you see this green uniform and you see the, this pistol and they do this and what do we do? Stop. Oh, gosh. We stop. I mean, most of us, even when we drive by radar, have an adrenaline rush. Okay. Okay. Well, maybe I was okay this time, but they just didn't catch me last, last time. The, the, the only difference here is authority. Authority. And if you don't believe that He has all authority, which He had proven in His, in, in, in his public ministry, over every realm possible, then, if you don't believe, then it doesn't matter what he's about to say. But if you believe the one who gives this mandate, this assignment, is completely in charge of everyone, including me and you, then we will at least drive to do what he says. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given me. I am in charge. Most of us, including me in the room, would give anything to wake up tomorrow and be more in charge. Not just of our life, but everybody who touches us. 
I told Linda in the, in the midst of one of my weeper moments when she was telling me, you can't do that, you can't do this. And, and, I, and, I, and I said to her, I hate to admit this to you publicly, and I said to her, why do you always have to be right? <laughs> We was just that admission. I hate it, honey, when you're in the trouble. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to thee. Go therefore and make disciples. Notice in the bowl, make disciples. That's the central commission mandate. Make them as Kevin prayed. Jesus just assumed we would not try to make one if we were not one. That's just common sense. You can't make what, you, what, what you're not. So being one precedes uh, helping others to become one. And he explains to us, okay, here's the man they make disciples, but the real question is, but how do you do that? And he gives us three, I've got them in italics up here, really modifying uh, participles or adjectives of that main verb on explaining how do we make disciples. By going, therefore, by going, as you are living, as you go to work, as you go to the grocery, as you go on vacation, as you go to this, and as you go to that. You know, first and foremost, you're just trying to live the life and uh, be the salt and, the, and, 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 and to be the light. Uh, and uh, and to give uh, give credit where credit's due of the transformation in your life as you are going in life, it's a lifestyle. Okay, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptism is the visual, the the the, the, the uh, objective uh, 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 confirmation, affirmation of that which has already taken place inside salvation. Last night I went over to a church family house. And uh, really, there are two blended families. Uh, 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 the reason they, they've been two blended families for years, not because of divorce, but because the mother died years ago, left behind five children. Daddy ended up in prison for eight years, and a family of four took in the family of five, and they merged years ago and have been a family. Can you imagine that? And uh, and it's had a profound impact. Spiritually, and uh, uh, they asked me when I come over last night, and, and uh, one of the daughters is leaving to go uh, uh, play volleyball at the University of Colorado. Uh, uh, and the other two are still in high school, asking me to baptize them. So I did that last night in their swimming pool in the rain. <laughs> and uh, but before I baptized any of them, and I had forewarned them. You're going to give a public confession of when you came into a personal relationship with Christ. Because baptism is a picture of that confession publicly. And, and, they, uh, and all three of the teenagers did. And then, uh, 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 and then we uh, baptized them. Baptism is that public, as it were, confession of Christ. And it's important. And then the third part of the process is teaching them, instructing them. Uh, modeling for them, being an example for them, you know, getting them to read the Word of God, all the things that goes in teaching them to observe, to obey. It's not just about knowing. Uh, you know, in Scripture, the opposite of knowledge is not ignorance, it's disobedience. We don't really know something biblically until we're living it out. Teaching them to observe all that I have demanded you. Now, notice the very last uh, sentence. And behold, I am with you always to the close of the age. Do you think that promise is only related to the physical aspect of Jesus? Because Jesus is only here for a relatively short period of time. This is not a promise of His physical presence because He wasn't with Him. Is he? Jesus makes a promise that if you do what I'm asking you to do, then I am going to promise those of you who do that my ongoing, indwelling, empowering presence in your life. And oh, isn't that what we want? To know that God is a liar in our lives and living and working through us. I read years ago these words along, along this line. 
the tragedy of the lives of most Christians is not that they're terribly uh, uh, immoral or disobedient, because frankly they are. The tragedy of the lives of most Christians is that their lives are basically inconsequential. <laughs> They have a general relationship with Christ because of read your Bible, go to church, give. Is it possible that what they be missing is the empowering, not the indwelling, he's there, the empowering presence of God working through our lives because we fail to make the disciples, because perhaps we fail to first of all, foremost, be one that he would challenge and call us to be. That is great food for thought. Uh, 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 anyways, in our lives. Okay? So, that leads me to the question, who or what is a disciple? We're to be one. We're, we're to be. But if you ever stop to ask yourself the question, what is it? Who is it? So I want you to help me with something. I was going to write on the board, but I'm not sure many folks in the back room can see it. So I'm just asking you to shout it out. Based on, based on your knowledge, obviously, uh, probably the Gospels and Jesus' uh, teaching. If I were to ask you, what are the marks of someone who is a disciple, a follower of, of Christ, for example, probably one I'm a follower of What are the marks of a disciple that Jesus spoke of? Uh, you know, in uh, in his time on in his teaching, the question does the question make sense? Okay, so just just shout out, you know, what are some of those marks? I'm sorry, gentle, gentle and loving, faith of a child, imitator. Very good word. Fat. Some of us got that down. We're talking spiritually here. Faithful, available, and teachable. Good word. Somebody else. Obedient. Good word. Good call. A disciple is what? Faith of a child. They have the faith of a child. Faith of a child. The trust, dependence of a child. Servant. Where? Servant. 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 Okay, uh, serving, servant hearted. Okay? Humble. Humble, oh, good word. <laughs> Imitator. Imitator, what did you say? Loving. Loving, oh, by this will all men know you're disciples, okay? And that if you put up with one another. No, that's not it. That's just a reverse standard version. Sorry, I forgot that one. Okay? Integrity, honesty. Interestingly, and I'll, I'll probably put it on uh, your handout for next week. <clears throat> Back years ago when I was doing my doctoral work, I had a seminar on, uh, really on discipleship. And I uh, had to do a paper and to answer, uh, 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 these were some of the questions I had to answer. Who is a disciple? And how do you make one? Because you have to determine as it were the product before you can establish the process to get there. And I did an in-depth study years ago, and I pulled that out. I came out one day this week looking for it. You gotta remember, I'm a pack rat. I keep everything. Okay, this goes back years, and I still have that paper. And uh, I went through the Gospels and came up with uh, 14, you know, 11, 15 many of which uh, you alluded to, uh, 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 outcomes of being a follower of Christ, being a disciple. And I remember when I created that, in fact, I wrote it in my conclusion. And I said to my professor, I, coming to these conclusions, I feel like I'll never get there. I was overwhelmed. 
I mean, if you stop to think of the 8, 10, or 12 that, that you shouted out, that's overwhelming. It's almost self-defeating. I, 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 I can't do that, so what am I trying? It's just more than anyone, especially they can possibly do. And uh, uh, I remember my professor and I had a pretty lengthy conversation, uh, you know, uh, uh, about that. And over the years now, as I have studied more about who we are, which is what we are when we become a Christian and a disciple, there's one and the same. There are three basic concepts that really all the things you said could be put underneath one of these three. Uh, in Scripture, there are three basic terms that make reference to who a disciple is and what a disciple does. The first and the foremost one is a learner. A learner. Uh, there, there's a noun and there's a, uh, a verb in the Greek translated in English called manthano or mathetes about 260 times in the, uh, in the, in the Gospels. And it means uh, uh, the, the Old Testament equivalent of that word would be, uh, somebody would, make, would be to do the will of God. A disciple is someone who is learning, you know, getting the content and the information and the knowledge of the principles and the teachings and the attitudes and actions that Jesus wants, all of which, many of which that you mentioned, <laughs> and is doing those in his or her life. They're learning. There's a learning aspect that's critical to this. And then a follower. Someone who is seeking to obey that which they have learned. That which they have learned. Now, you, you might find it interesting. Do you know what the most often repeated phrase of Jesus is that's recorded in the Gospels? He said this more than he said anything else. Pardon? Sorry? That's the second. No. He's the son of man. Follow me. Follow me. Sixteen times. Follow me. I think if you lived and walked with Jesus the other day and you walked up in and said, listen, just Pull it down as simple, straightforward as you possibly can. What does it mean to be Christian? I wonder if Jesus would answer, follow me. Just so attach yourself to me, learn of me, you know, get the attitudes and actions and beliefs and behaviors that I'm looking for, that I won't live out of those who are trying, uh, trying to be like me and follow me. Just imitate me, follow me. And then as you were doing that, you moved through, as it were, infancy and childhood and adolescence into adulthood, where supposedly you earned the right of reproductivity. Okay? And then you're able to begin in others to reproduce the life that you're trying to live out. Not perfectly. Not perfectly, because none of us do that. Sometimes our greatest point of connect with other disciples is not in our obedience, but in our disobedience. Because we all get there. We all get there. Okay. So a disciple is a learner and a follower and a uh, and a uh, uh, and a uh, uh, reproducer. Okay. Now, in Matthew chapter ten, turn there. Let me wrap up. In Matthew chapter ten. Matthew chapter ten. I have given you kind of the overview of the chapter of being a disciple. Let me read. I have probably said I used today things. This is something I cut out of a, uh, out of a, a publication of peace that came from a public ministry. And it so caught my attention back in the early 80s. I still had the original that I cut out. See if you can identify this person. For a number of years after I became a Christian, I messed around with spiritual things. Just messed around. I ran around with church folks. I learned the God talk. I sang the hymns. I even memorized verses. I prayed pretty good prayers. I carried my Bible to church Sunday after Sunday. I sang in the choir. I added to my schedule a Bible class or two every now and then. My life was my life. 
I did not let all that religious stuff interfere with the things uh, like my career, my home, my strong will, my pursuit of things, my determination to go my own way, or my own personal plans. I wasn't a wife beater or a criminal or an alcoholic or some awful notorious sinner. No, I was just a selfish man. I knew how to get what I wanted and nothing was going to stand in my way. Stubborn and opinionated, I rolled up my sleeves and was ready to slug it out with whoever stood in my way, including God. I was a Christian, but certainly not a disciple. Hmm? I mean, it does sound like all of us. It does, doesn't it? You know who wrote that? Chuck Swindoll. Chuck Swindoll. But probably most of us could sign our name. Sign our name. What these next weeks are about is how do we become more of a disciple? And in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is quickly. And I think in Matthew 10. Though Jesus talked about what it means to be a disciple, a little bit of discipleship here and there, this is the most comprehensive in one place teaching about what Jesus believed about discipleship, who is a disciple, and what are the expectations of those who say that they want to follow me. It is some of the most demanding, some of the most difficult, some of the most convicting of all of the teachings of Jesus. It will force me and you these next few weeks to examine the level of our commitment to Christ. And of course, my goal is for all of us to come here to learn, to apply, and to up that level, including me, in terms of what it means to be a follower of Christ. What Jesus does in this chapter is He kind of lays down, here's the commission, here's the call, we all have that. And then He instructs them how to, how, how to go out and to represent Him, kind of like in that great commission. In fact, three times I think it says go. And then in verses 16 to 23, He begins to warn them, if you go out to make disciples, because you are being one, I need to warn you, the world in which you live will not give you a warm reception. Boy, has that ever been more true than today. And then beginning in verse 24 through 42, which is where we're going to study, 24 to 42, Jesus challenges them and basically tells them here is what it's going to cost. Here's what you need to be willing to do. Here are the demands of being a follower of me. And he, I think he basically, though he doesn't use this, I think basically he's asking each of us this question. Am I willing to pay the price? Am I willing to pay the price? So what I want you to do, go to the next, uh, I think it's a sign, go to the next slide. I believe in repetitive reading. I think that's how we get God's Word into our mind and heart. I want you to read for next week verses 1 through 25. You're welcome to read all 42, but especially 1 through 25. Kind of read it several times and really, really focus on verses 24 and 25, the last two verses. The last two verses, which next week we'll get into the basic foundational premise of what the goal in this life is of being a disciple of Christ. Okay? Now, here are the two questions. Uh, I want you to spend just a few minutes around the table and then I'll have a word of prayer and turn it over to you. Here's number one. I mentioned you earlier. Would you still be a Christ follower if there were no assurances and hope? Why? Why not? I obviously have to implore you to be honest, but uh, when you're around a table of five, six, or seven or eight people, it can pretty get uncomfortable. Okay? And then secondly, I began with this statement, salvation is a gift with a goal. What are your thoughts about that? I mean, we have to agree. Just, it's my thing. I know you agree with the first part, the gift, uh, but what about the last? Okay? Hey, gang, I can't tell you how good it is to be back and to see most of your faces. 
<laughs> the author. <laughs> and uh, just thrilled. Let's get into this book. This is the, I really thank for the last two years of the teachings that I've done largely in here. And I don't mind the word of any of this. I ask you to pray for me so it's your own fault. Okay? <laughs> this is where God just kept bringing uh, I, I, I'm just trying to be as honest as I can. These next four or five weeks are going to be very difficult. Okay? Let's let that be okay. Okay? Because a lot of times change takes place because of discomfort. Okay? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the joy of being back. Thank you for lessons from a different place. Thank you for, again, the encouragement, the prayer, the cards, the love. Uh, from the folks in this room to some that are not even here today. We thank you for the study we're embarking on. We understand it's from you. It's your word. It's your teaching. And uh, we're hopefully willing to embrace uh, uh, this discomfort uh, and uh, tension that, that we're going to feel about our own journey as a disciple. And Lord, I, I'm not here to question the, the conversion or salvation of uh, uh, folks. Uh, you know, uh, you know, most, if not all, folks. You know, they know you. They, they, they love you and, and recognize their need for you. But we want them to be all the followers like He wants to be. And we really need to understand what that is, even if it's difficult. At least we know what we're aiming for. So bless the time now, discussion around the table, and give us a good week of reading in Matthew 10 that morning. In Jesus' name, I pray.